Welcome to the Antifada, where unrest is best. I'm Jamie Peck. I'm Sean KB. And we are here with a special guest host today. Oh, wait, are you going to pretend to be Andy every day? doesn't have to. I'm Andy Kindler. <laughs> Hello. Oh, shit. Am I the only <laughs> Jew in the Antifada? It's Andy Kindler. Oh, we got the wrong Andy. Uh, not AP Andy, Andy Kindler. <laughs> Whoops! Uh, he he must have just been looking for Sam or something. I uh, I know Ricky he's Gervais Sam. guy. Is that a comic? <laughs> is he even Jewish? <laughs> uh, I now, don't think he is, Andy. Now now do your um, Judy Gold. <laughs> <laughs> Trump is a fucking scumbag. He looks like somebody shit in a fucking bag and then filled it with tampons. And Mike Pence is fucking gay. <laughs> That's he's Judy fucking Gold. gay people, and Trump is fucking fat. All right. I can I say that because I'm a dyke. Spotted. I like how we're we're all in the MR studio, so we're like tyrannized by all the characters on Majority oh Report. Uh, let's not say that too loud. Uh, Nation of Islam Obama might come <laughs> to uh, say hi, say something problematic that you can't get away with saying in your normal voice. Well, I think Will should be able to sit in Matt Lex's seat because uh, once you get in, you know, this area, you're just immediately high on marijuana. I think that's what how it works, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are going to be talking about some real bong rip shit today. We've got an excellent interview lined up with, uh, I, I think maybe my favorite science fiction author. Is that, I don't know about you guys. Uh, you might have another he's, favorite. He's neck and neck with Ursula Le Guin for me. Will? He's in the convo. He's in the convo. He, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson is his name. And, uh, flap, flap, pew, 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 pew. And we're going to be talking with him oh about God. how to integrate a sort of leftist futurism with with literature that is interesting and fun and enjoyable and touches on all aspects of human life without being completely fucking boring like so it's, much leftist literature is. It's so it's so good. Um, I'm not even going to try to pretend that we didn't already do the interview because I think I'm still a little bit high on talking to one of my sci-fi heroes. How about you, Will? Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you guys for letting me uh, sit, in, sit in on this one. Um, yeah. I've been a huge admirer of uh, Kim Stanley Robinson ever since I read his uh, his Mars trilogy, um, and I've, I've I've stayed with him, and you know he, he is a, a you know. Uh, he's a sci-fi writer, but he's also, you know, of the left. And his books, I think, most importantly, deal there. You know, deal with a future, but like not just a future, but a post-capitalist future. And I think an important thing that's touched on in this interview that I, I like about his work, and I think is really important, and going against the grain of popular culture today, is that he is sort of uh, against a kind of like dystopian or apocalyptic future, but one that still takes seriously, you know, the, the c- catastrophes of politics or the yeah. Environment or any of these things that can happen, but 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 that doesn't just take for granted that we're all going to be you know shitting in our hands and you know eating dirt uh, in the next fifty years, which you know as he says in the interview could happen, yeah. But it doesn't have to happen, and there's no like it's it's a failure of imagination on the part of our culture that all science fiction now and all really every vision we have about the future is inherently apocalyptic. It's a it's a kind of laziness yeah, in our imagination yeah. and our politics yeah. that I think. He does a really good job of getting past. Well, it's easy to feel sort of cynical and dystopian when you're so mired in what's happening right now in current events, yeah. right? Because things are pretty dark right now. And uh, I think especially when you do a show uh, that is like sort of hooked to the news cycle, like every single day, like I do at Majority Report, um, if that's all you see then like yeah you do start to feel kind of doom and gloom as a leftist right um which is why it's so important to look to the future and not just like 2020 not just a few years down the line but like the far looking future um and what's possible for humanity yeah that's a really good point i mean so much of of what we do uh, and i mean we in the larger sense in the in the culture or as individuals or people in the media which i guess we are uh is uh yeah is very short-term thinking right about like you know how are we going to organize this campaign uh how are we going to canvas how are we going to get more members for our organization what's the next you know big social struggle that's coming up and it is so easy to lose sight of you know 
what happens not just two years, but 20 years and even 200 years is important because, you know, as human beings, uh, we're ultimately passing something down to generations, uh, you know, in the future. And what we do today has a huge effect on, you know, how those people are going to be living in, uh, hopefully living because uh, socialism or barbarism is more real now than I think it's ever been oh, yeah. uh, with the, with climate change and uh, the this reactionary wave that we're seeing right now. But, you know, I would say that that science fiction has always been instrumental for me, um, I, I, not to like pop psychologize myself, but uh, maybe there's something about the fact that I'm really into history or I'm really into the future that says something about my idea of the present. <laughs> because ever since I was a kid, it was always either yeah. like history in the past or science fiction in the future. Yeah, no, I think it's I, I mean, same here. Because I think, honestly, especially in fiction, unless you're like an ex- extremely talented like novelist, like a writer of the highest level, I think it's almost impossible to say anything meaningful about the present moment in fiction writing about it now. Right. Like, so to me, like writing about the past or writing about the future is to me like the most interesting way of talking about, you know, your uh, our lived experience or the cultural moment that you're in without being, you know, cloying or forgettable or just instantly disposable. Like, um, you know, much art is not that it's all bad, but it just sort of, you know, you forget it. It's just you consume it and forget it. And I guess if you're, if you're not familiar with Kim Stanley Robinson's books, I mean, the Mars trilogy is sort of the, the entry for a lot of people. And in that, in those three novels, he, he sort of creates a kind of history over several centuries of the human colonization and terraforming of Mars and, you know, through characters and through fiction really describes a political, economic and ecological process and and both the individual characters political choices and inputs in that and, and sort of a broader vision of, of humanity and ecology that is uh, fascinating and I think really useful towards understanding you know our present political moment yeah, well I think time you... is a flat circle so <laughs> if you think about it really uh, the future is just history that hasn't happened yet from our current vantage point within the fourth dimension which of course is time that is not the first bong rip uh, thing that will be said uh, during the course of this episode mm-hmm. as uh, we get deep into the spiritual and psychological and psychedelic aspects of uh, uh, Stan's worldview. Oh, and we're going work. deep. We're going deep. We're going all the way in. I think the last thing I would say before we get into the interview is that um, I, I think, Will, you pointed towards this, too. It's important, too, to, to kind of... Um, when we're talking about technology, we're talking about history, uh, we're talking about these grand sweeping events, and we're talking about political change, it's so easy to lose the human, you know, the actual relationships and the psychology and um, the importance of uh, the individual and their relationships. And I think what Kim Stanley Robinson does excellently is he's able to, say, write a series of, no- of novels, a trilogy that goes, spans th- uh, hundreds of years, rather, and uh, at the same time, make it human. You know, because ultimately, you know, if uh, nothing human is, is alien to us, we need to always uh, keep track of that and, and, and be aware of that moving forward. And things like the Mars Trilogy and his other works, I think, are really good at kind of squaring the circle between the meta and, and the individual. Yeah. Science nerd shit, but make it human. Exactly. Like, I, I always I wasn't really. OK, so. True story. Sean got me into sci-fi. Uh, I was kind of into sci-fi and fantasy when I was a kid and then, you know, grew up and I'm like, oh, that's for nerds. But um, Sean, I don't know if he did this on purpose, but uh, he... <coughs> no comment. He uh, he gave me a little book to read called The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin. And it really got me thinking through uh, some of these ideas about um, socialism, particularly more anarchist versions of socialism in a way that I hadn't before and probably wouldn't if it was not also a book with lots of, you know, relationships, love and sex and fun stuff too it's like it's all it's all part of the same uh delicious yin yang messy hole and i think he does a very um you know so to speak i think he does a very good job bringing those things together in a way that uh really hits the back walls of your mind indeed indeed it does uh well this this interview uh touched all the walls of my mind for sure the hallways of always folks that's where we're going right now and and like i think um if people want a little 
intro to the way that he envisions utopia. Uh, you know, maybe you don't have time to read a whole book right now, although you should read, you know, all of his books, of course. Um, he wrote, Kim Stanley Robinson wrote a great article in Commune magazine yes. about the role of utopia and uh, the sort of lazy cynicism that people can fall into with dystopia. And I, I really like it because I think the utopia has been wrong the the utopian has been wrongfully painted as this naivete um in politics in culture whatever when it this is this is something i think about a lot um he used the term asymptote Mm, in conversation and in the book to talk about um human development in various ways and i that, that's kind of a big part of how I envision communism, right? Because full communism is obviously this utopian vision, right? People make memes about it. We're all just like Good memes, floating though. orbs in space, just like doing butt stuff and <laughs> having... That's literally in 2312, by the way. <laughs> having a nice time. Read the book, folks. But, um, and like, you know, maybe, we'll, maybe we won't ever get there. But... <laughs> but there's a but uh we that doesn't mean we can't try right and if communism or if what we conceive of right as our like democratic socialist society or whatever is striving ever closer to, butt to stuff. uh that <laughs> delectable goal um maybe that's good enough everybody on the forward march not one step back towards full butt stuff communism and on that note uh here is our interview with kim stanley robinson i hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoyed doing it boom all right we are here with author award-winning author and science fiction hero of all of ours kim stanley robinson hi stan thanks for being with us hi sean it's good to be there uh jamie i think is going to start the round of questions we are here with of course will menneker still hello and uh yes we're all extremely excited for this so uh stan jamie's gonna start throwing some uh curveballs at you just kidding they're, they're gonna be they're gonna be softballs okay <laughs> yeah, right. here's, here's a gotcha question <laughs> just kidding okay. uh it's a nice question um so about two years ago i think i pitched and got assigned an interview with the sci-fi author ursula Le Guin, who was very influential in my own life and my own uh political awakening shall we say but uh unfortunately she passed away before i had a chance to speak with her and i know you studied under her at uc san diego and i'm sorry for your loss as well as the world's loss um what can you tell us about ursula Le Guin, about her influence on you on your own work and maybe the world in general Well, thank you for that. I love to talk about Ursula Le Guin. She was indeed my teacher, which is a remarkable coincidence uh, that I treasure. I had uh, gone to UC San Diego as an undergraduate, gone off to graduate school in Boston, freaked out at the wintertime in Boston, and retreated to San Diego, uh, where I took up graduate school there instead of in Boston. And I felt like an idiot after I got back to San Diego. But the, the, uh, right soon after I got back, UC San Diego's literature department announced they had gotten Le Guin to agree to come to teach for spring quarter. And so then I thought, well, maybe it wasn't so stupid after all. And Uh, my going back to San Diego. It was, at that point, I had sold several um, science fiction short stories. I was completely committed to being a science fiction writer. I'd been to Clarion. I'd been reading intensively for about, at that point, no more than six or seven years, but very intense reading. And Le Guin uh, had published in the same time that I had gotten into science fiction, um, well, she had already published The Left Hand of Darkness, but while I was into it, she published uh, Lathe of Heaven and The Dispossessed, and The Dispossessed was a, a mind boggler that I had read about two years before she showed up at UCSD. And so she was, even then, um, the preeminent American science fiction writer. It was pretty clear to everybody, and especially if you're on the left. I'm sorry, so are those I, wind chimes in the background? 
Yeah, is that bad? It's, it's kind of uh, endearing, actually. It's kind of charming. <laughs> uh, I, I am. Uh, it's a windy day. I'm outdoors where I always work, and it's sunny. It's cold but sunny, and I can put the kibosh on the wind chimes if you want. You know, we're recording in Brooklyn now, and we don't know where our listeners are in the world right now. They probably don't have access to wind chimes, and I don't think it's a problem. Let's just allow that <laughs> okay. ambient uh, yeah. wind chime to, to go in the background. Let's let's just keep rolling okay. with it. Well, I can say also that I'm taking part in Cornell University's uh, great uh, bird count. And so today is the last day of a bird count where you count and name all the birds that you see. And so I'm out next to my bird feeder. And while we're talking, I'm keeping a little uh, tabulation on how many white crowned sparrows show up. Uh, Stan, so, can we get can we get a count on how many birds you've seen today? <laughs> or uh, any any uh, in particular? You sure the heck can. I have seen, um, I don't know if I, you want as much detail as I could give you, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, about just the ten, highlight uh, reel within reason. Well, yeah. The high rights, two <laughs> yellow-billed magpies. They are absolutely only local to this part of the valley. Birders come from all over the world to see these yellow-billed magpies. Lots of crows, lots of Canada geese, lots of uh, I call them little beige birds because I'm not a real birder. <laughs> a red, uh, red-tailed hawk, a Swainson's hawk, a flicker, and a little bluebird that I've never seen before. So that the bird hunt seems to have called up for me, and a lot of uh, goldfinches. There, um, perhaps it's wow. uh, evolutionary psychology and our desire to be surrounded by wilderness and nature, but I'm feeling uh, a little bit jealous right now, I have to say. I've seen zero birds today, unfortunately. You see yes, yeah. yes. Uh, Brooklyn, I, I know Brooklyn a little bit, and I love Brooklyn, but it doesn't seem like a great uh, birder a well, spot. You know, there's, the st- there's the standard pigeon, but then, of course, you know, yes. sparrows and starlings are about the most common. I, occasionally, I do see a hawks, hawks in Brooklyn. Right. They have a, a thing with the skyscraper setbacks. Uh, um, I go to the – if you go over to the river up at – is it Astoria? At Hellgate, mm-hmm. there's some um, – I did a quite extensive exploration of Brooklyn uh, and of the New York area for when I was writing my New York 2140. And – uh, my best friend in New York lives in Brooklyn and took me to places uh, that I wouldn't have known to go to that got into the book. And I'm always looking for birds, although I have to say I'm not a good birder. I don't know what I'm seeing most of the time, but I've gotten really interested in them because of my work life here. Well, uh, it's, I, I always write in my front yard, and, and that's what I, Davis gives me. Oh, yeah. We saw a picture of that in, uh, I think, the article that Wired did on you, and it looks like a really delightful and lovely place to work. It is. It's um, a a little bit freakish what I've done. About 10 years of sitting in this chair where I'm sitting right now, looking at the bird feeder and at my gates and my fence and my Japanese maple. And uh, I know what season it is because of the tilt of the sun over to my left and on it goes like that. Um, I see the sky, the clouds, the, the wind and the trees right now. Um, it's beautiful, and it has put many years uh, onto my writing life that might not have happened because I was feeling so burned out 10 or 15 years ago when I um, when I moved out here and discovered that I wasn't burnt out on writing. I was burnt out on sitting indoors. And well, well, I can sit outdoors all the time very happily, that's <laughs> but a, not indoors. That's amazing. Uh, because uh, I think that all of us here appreciate that, uh, you know, that burnout has passed. And thank you to Davis, uh, California, for uh, allowing you to make uh, all the great novels that you've done. So you you worked with um, Ursula Le Guin. And I, I think uh, I saw somewhere, too, that the um, famous uh, Marxist cultural critic, uh, Frederick Jameson, was also part of your, uh, uh, your studies and your inspiration. Uh, so between Ursula Le Guin and Frederick Jameson and your other experiences in life, um, how did you become radicalized? How did you become an anti-capitalist? And how has that affected your work? Yeah, I, I'm sorry I stopped you in the middle of talking about no, Ursula. I, I think it, it's better to have an organic conversation. And it's good for me to uh, kind of collect my uh, thoughts as well. Um, it, it, Jameson was crucial. And the the third of the of the great writers that I was lucky enough to have as teachers, and I'm I'm astonished at the luck involved with this. Uh, the third is Gary Snyder, the California poet, and you might call him an eco 
uh, a Buddhist eco warrior, a leftist for sure, and a hero of mine since before. the same time that I was beginning to read science fiction, I was reading poetry and Zen, Buddhist texts. This is all very California hippie, 1972 type uh, intellectual background. And I discovered the Sierra Nevada, and Fred Jameson was my first uh, French professor beyond the conversational classes, the first literature classes. And he insisted on us all speaking French, which was a bizarre constraint, because I only had about 100 words of French in me. <laughs> and he assigned uh, the short plays of Camus and of Sartre. And so we read those plays, and we discussed them in French, and Fred was very patient with us, very slow uh, in his speaking, and very clear, and also so very existentialist, and uh, I didn't realize it at the time, uh, and very Marxist. So it was the 70s. The Vietnam War was still going. I had a draft number. I was radicalized by that, a very practical concern of not wanting to go to Vietnam and feeling like the war was a, a disaster and a crime. Uh, so it's very situational to my generation and the time that I came around. And I, I now think that that's true of everybody, that you are, that we're partly are just expressions of our historical periods. And the individual choices that we make are, are predicated on the opportunities of the time that you're in. And for me, the luck of running into Jameson, who is a very persuasive, very um, a modest man, a, a bookish guy. He loves uh, books and movies, and that's really the the way that he likes to talk about things is through literature. But he's a very committed um, Marxist, and he was, I guess, what you would call the preeminent American Marxist critic, and especially in Western Marxism, trying to figure out what what did it mean to be a Marxist after the uh, Soviet Union <clears throat> and uh, through the 70s and 80s. And so by reading him, he is my guide to everything else in the world of political theory. Uh, sometimes he'll make suggestions and I'll read the people that he suggested to me and I'll understand them and it'll be wonderful. People like um, Ernest Bloch or Raymond Williams. Oh, yeah. Um, um, and and many other of the famous Western Marxists. Other times he'll recommend someone as being uh, good to read, important, and I'll uh, read them and I won't understand them at all. And it seems to me that Jameson's summary of them is better than their own original writing in terms of clarifying their thoughts. Indeed. And I don't need to specify who because I, I can barely remember. But what I can say is that he was my uh, uh, political teacher and 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 a lot of it was just reading him. He moved to, away from UC San Diego before I was even done with my PhD. He was directing it. It was on Philip K. Dick. I was in heaven. He moved to Yale. So um, luckily, my undergraduate advisor, Donald Wessling, really good teacher, um, very strong um, a literature professor and a leftist, but um, not into science fiction at all. So Donald uh, took over my uh, PhD dissertation at that time. And Le Guin came when I was in graduate school early on. And Snyder, I was only a reader of, but he was the one that explained for me how nature fit into all this, that, that nature, culture, uh, political slash natural combination that I think is very important uh, to me and to everybody, Snyder was the, the great teacher there for me. And I ran into him years later up here in Davis, where he taught at UC Davis through the 90s. And I got to know him and we've become friends. Um, I love Gary and I probably know him the best of the three. Although I've stepped, I've stayed in excellent contact with uh, Fred, and I was in intermittent but warm contact with Ursula through the years. Well, you sort of um, anticipated uh, the question I was going to uh, bring up to you. Speaking of uh, being a product of a, a place in time, in this case, California in the 60s and 70s, and you writing your thesis on Philip K. Dick, I was just you know, really interested in, uh, first of all, like what the thesis was about and just uh, you know, what reading Dick for the first time like you responded to in his work. Sure. Uh, I love uh, Phil Dick and his work, although... Um, it's not my favorite. Um, he's not my favorite writer by any means. And when Jameson said to me, and this is like 1970. 
two or three, he said, if, read Phil Dick, he's the greatest living American writer, bar none. And I went out and I bought Galactic Pot Healer, and I read Galactic Pot Healer, and I said, what was he, why would he say that? This is just a ridiculous, uh, a scrawny little short story, very union, very spacey, very reality breakdown, very Philip K. Dick. Um, and you no, know, he said, read on. You got to read all of it. You got to read huge swaths of it. The individual books don't matter. It's the totality that matters, which, as usual with Fred, was a very smart way to go at it. And so then I read all of Dick under his direction, and I began to see what he was talking about. Um, he's, Dick is a tremendous novelist without being a great stylist. And the best of his books in terms of style is The Man in the High Castle. Oh, yes. Um, but even there, Ursula has an introduction to Man in High Castle that is very funny, talking about how everybody, even the Germans, speak in Japanese English, which, um, as Ursula says in their introduction, must pause to consider. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, you mentioned uh, like uh, uh, Jameson saying that you have to read him, uh, all of him, to get a kind of total effect. And his individual stories and novels do have kind of a shaggy dog quality. But when you read them like as an entire body of work, what do you think uh, emerges for you? Um, good question. I, uh, I think the little man, the ordinary person as hero of the novel. So this was revolutionary in science fiction where you had the kind of John W. Campbell uh, Superman, the Nietzschean Uber mentioned, uh, the spaceship captain, uh, Captain Kirk, blah, blah. And with Phil Dick, it's always the tire regroover, the vase repair person. Right. Um, and so ordinary people. And then I also love the structure of his novel which I've imitated many a time, which is you write from third-person limited point of view so that you're inside one character's mind, the narrator, speaking of them in third person but reading their thoughts, and the other characters are outsiders. And then in the next scene, it's a different character looking back at the first character from inside the second character's mind. And this roving point of view is an extremely powerful tool for shaping novels and giving you a sense of um, three dimensionality to the characterizations so um, in technical terms I think Dick even though he was writing um, you know on speed at a thousand miles an hour and, <laughs> and, and, and several of his novels like one year there were five novels and there was a five year period where there were 13 novels <laughs> and this is the mid 60s and uh, uh, he would write them in two weeks and so they're pretty um, slack and messy and rushed but on the other hand, they're really uh, powerful and strong. And so he's a mixed bag. And then also the political angle. He's, without being um, intensely theoretical about it, he's just instinctively anti-capitalist. His, his novels, and this is something Jameson taught me to see, they're all about the corrosive effects of capitalism on ordinary human relations, how it instrumentalizes everybody and you turn into a calculator of value, even if for other people. Um, and, and so Dick's novels are keep coming back to that. They're really about America in the 50s and 60s. And how- I, I always think of the uh, – in Ubik uh, where essentially everything is coin-operated, like from your front door <laughs> to your coffee machine. To ev- everything in that book uh, is about you know coins. And then, of course, the coin comes back uh, in terms yep. of t- telling you whether you're really alive or dead at one point in the book. Yes. I just had occasion to do a, an introduction to Ubik. I reread it for the first time time in about 40 years and it's just a long short story it's a mess and yet that exactly right what you pointed out the the fight that joe chip has with his door a, a coin operated door to get out of his apartment and trying to bargain about credit to get out of his apartment i mean it's ai it's it's all the stuff that we're thinking about right now um and 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 all done at this level, it's probably one of the greatest scenes he ever wrote because it's it's very funny and it's very penetrating. Um, so more on this on these political aspects, uh, we noticed reading your work uh, in both the Mars trilogy, uh, which we've all consumed at least once in this room, uh, but also I cried several times while reading it. I just want you to know that. <laughs> Thank you. In Thank a good you. in a good way, I'm sure she, <laughs> not a bad way. Um, yeah. But also then in a very, a very much a, a different novel, which is uh, Years of Rice and Salt, which is an alternative history. Um, in both novels, in both universes, there are these 
specific moments where it seems like the kind of collective scientific knowledge and social awareness of human beings uh, kind of combine together to create a, a sort of uh, phase change in human affairs. Uh, it, it's almost like in, in both of these instances, whether it's the past or, or an imagined future, um, P, uh, humanity is able to create something like historical materialism, something like ways of grasping the kind of interconnectedness of all the people and uh, being able to overcome tyranny and division and want. This seems to be a, a theme in your work. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, about how uh, people are situated and how we collectively understand the world? Sure. Um, it seems to me the basic uh, problem or issue, the, it brings up just the question of history. And is it uh, a story of us pulling our act together and making a better civilization? Or is it just one set of power dynamics after another? And so I, it comes to a question of what is revolution? Can there be revolution anymore? It, it, are revolutions more positive than negative when you consider the violence and the backlashes? And could there be um, a peaceful, um, somewhat organized revolution, what Raymond Williams calls the, raw, the long revolution, or you might just say um, social demo democracy type uh, reform from within the legal systems instead of, could you, if you did enough of those and did them um, smartly enough, could that constitute a revolution instead of the, the classic form of the French or the Russian or the American revolution of armed revolt and violence and death and then subsequent reactionary backlash, which especially in the French and the Russian was obvious and in the American one more subtle and strange. Um, so I'm, I keep trying to write stories where that could be the topic and um, it, it, it presents a problem for the novelist. It's a problem that historical novelists have had all along. And science fiction is kind of the flip side of the historical novel in that you're trying to write both individual lives, characters that you care about, the kind of telepathy of being inside someone else's head. And the novel is really a bourgeois form. It's about the individual consciousness in a lot of ways, and then small groups. Um, and then how does it encompass history? How do you include also history itself? Well, your characters have to go through something big. And so in both the Mars trilogy and in Years of Rice and Salt, I invented ways of having individual humans that lived longer than we usually live. Right, right. Um, the longevity treatment in the Mars trilogy and reincarnation yeah. <laughs> in the Years of Rice and Salt. And the Bardo, uh, that was fascinating, yeah. Yes, and so this gave me a chance to talk about history explicitly and keep it at the level of characters and in my other novels where I've tried to deal with both these elements at once but with ordinary human lifetimes I've struggled to make it work and the, the novel that I think is best called Green Earth, my Washington D.C. trilogy um, and in several other books uh, 2312 or the one that I'm working on now um, I've been trying to continue to do that kind of project and write about uh, moments of historical change that maybe they aren't revolutions, but they might be revolutionary in their ultimate impacts. Um, speaking of uh, uh, your work, and I, I think sort of a, a, a contrast in my mind with, with your work and other more other forms of science fiction, is, is it would seem to me that the, the dominant mode in science fiction, or really most of our popular culture right now, is overwhelmingly dystopian and apocalyptic in that like everyone just sort of seems to assume that uh, the, the Mad Max scenario is the future we're headed for. Uh, how do your books consciously go against that? Like particularly, and why do you think that's important, particularly from a, a sort of leftist perspective? Well, um, this brings me back to much that I have learned from Jameson. Um, this is really kind of Jamesonian to say, it's dialectical. Dystopia is the flip side of utopia. Um, it's it's a, a political response, and it's therefore interesting. Uh, but he's also commented from time to time that we're we're weirdly comforted by dystopia, that it's a way of assuring contemporary readers that as bad as things are for us, it's not as bad as it's going to be for these poor characters in the future. And so 
you can read dystopias badly or they can serve a bad function of just um, comforting you with kind of disaster porn that you read from a semi-comfortable a spot in the precariat in this current year. But there's another way of reading it, and I know that Jameson would agree with this, too, that it's an expression of how people are feeling, and novels are very important for that. How do young people feel today? Well, they feel uh, scared, put upon, um, hopeless, and so dystopias have this immediate expression of a political feeling. So the political unconscious, as Jameson would call it, of dystopian texts is a sense of uh, entrapment and despair, and and, they're, and so they are an honest feeling. But once you've expressed that feeling, you have to turn it over uh, and think about the utopian view that the reason that dystopias appeal to us is that there's a broad sense that things could be better and that the future could be made to be better by what we do now. So I, this is, uh, for me, I think dystopias are easy and now it's a little complacent. It's, uh, it's become a kind of a cliche or, or a marketing category and it's too easy that in fact after the there won't be mad max um although that's a kind of a worst case scenario but it won't be an end there will still be humans it, um, this whole notion that it goes back to um, a, a kind of Hobbesian war of all against all is uh, is a reading of human nature that flies in the face of sociobiology itself and we're actually incredibly social, incredibly altruistic and cooperative. And it may be that we're only uh, altruistic within tight um, circles of family or group or kin or even supposedly nation state or ethnic, although those are mostly concoctions. But um, we, we actually are team players. So What's interesting is to say after a disaster, what does ordinary feel like for people who only know the post um, apocalyptic state? And so that was what I was trying to write about in New York 2140. After the sea levels rise and there's a half century of utter disaster and chaos, then life goes on and the young people of that time, that's all they know. They just think of it as normal. Oh, the past, there were disasters. Here we are in this new normality. And that's what dystopia misses out on. This this notion that it's going to be a boot in your face forever is, is uh, simplistic, I guess I'd say. Yeah, um, I really like the way you put that. And I really like the way you put it in Blue Mars, too, when you write, um, it was a crisis which could have triggered a terminal disaster, a descent into chaos and barbarity. And instead, it was being met head on by the greatest efflorescence of civilization in history, a new renaissance. Uh, and I feel like that's a theme in a lot of your work, um, which is both like sort of catastrophist because, you know, bad things happen and bad things probably are going to happen in real life, but also very optimistic in that, you know, human nature it's a very difficult thing to define, but it definitely contains at least the possibility for a kind of pulling together that we see already, you know, amid uh, disasters or what have you, and people help each other out. Um, it, it's, it's cool to think about, especially because I have to deal with people on a day-to-day -day basis who think that, um, you know, I'm not being practical by being a uh, utopian or being ideological and people whose horizon is like, I don't know, some kind of left liberalism, um, are not being ideological. Um, they're just being realistic <laughs> about the possibilities of humanity. Right. Yes. There's, um, what I call a fashionable cynicism or it's also a self protective in that I don't want to seem naive. I don't want to seem stupid. And so a very, very often being uh, labeled optimistic, which I often am, this is code for the poor guy, he's stupid. <laughs> um, he doesn't get it how bad things really are. And, yeah. you know, maybe it's biochemical, maybe he's just fooled. But it's, um, you put a, you put yourself out there in a risky position when you say um, things could be better or um, that it, it actually is a remarkable achievement for nearly 8 billion people to be alive on this planet without everybody already killing each other, that it could be so much worse that you have to keep a balanced view of that. 
uh, and 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 the balance is hard because you have to admit that a we're on the edge of a mass extinction event that could be really devastating that gets us to the true dystopia even to the Mad Max moment of ultimate devastation uh, that's possible and so with that uh, kept in mind it's so scary that when you say well but on the other hand we also could have um, inclusive prosperity as this new economics group is has called it, which is not a bad name, uh, especially if you include the whole biosphere in the inclusion, that that's also possible. Well, since it is, you ought not to deny that either. And what you come to is a completely bizarre moment, which maybe every moment in human history has been the same, but it feels m more bizarre now. I don't know why. That we could, from the moment we're in right in this moment, it could be a terrible human future and biosphere future, or it could be a pretty great human future and biosphere future. Both are equally physically possible. And so then the political work becomes to try to shove it towards the good future. And, and on, a, in the, on the most fundamental level, just to dodge the bad future. Um, so, so yeah. We're, we're back to the uh, socialism or barbarism. Well, yeah, like I think years back, right? this moment, yes. it's becoming yeah. more and more clear because we have this historically unprecedented pressure of climate change. And, you know, even people who used to pretend that it wasn't happening aren't pretending that anymore um but you still hear people say things like oh uh you know we could have a green new deal and try to stave off climate disaster uh and like save the human race from dying out but it might be too expensive so maybe not like what's yeah. up with that <laughs> It's um, the the attacks on the Green New Deal have been revealing how shoddy and insufficient that ideology is at this point. The old style Republican capitalist uh, business as usual that is leading us to the mass extinction event just looks bad. There is uh, even old time right wingers who are used to sounding plausible with 50 years experience like George Will, their attacks on the Green New Deal are entirely empty of substance. And usually they, they toss the word. They say, oh, but that's socialism, as if that is a QED on how right. why it can't be done at all. And um, one thing that Jameson pointed out quite recently in a lecture at Duke, which I'm listening in on as if it's a podcast, is that uh, in the previous moments of American leftism that have been prominent and then crushed. This is after World War One, and then after World War Two, and then the third one would be in the 60s. They all uh, had a moment of efflorescence and appeal, and then they all got uh, crushed by um, political reversals and by a deliberate suppression. But none of them ever dared to say the word socialism in America, mostly after World War One. But this is Jameson's point, is that the idea would be that the socialist cause in the United States would do the good things without telling the general American public what they were in a kind of an avant-gardeism. And then after the fact, after we were in a better state, say, oh, by the way, that's actually socialism, which was a, um, a silly way to go up about it because the American populace isn't that easily fooled and we are the American populace. And so what's different this time, he pointed out, is that people are unabashedly using the word socialism and claiming that it's okay to say that word and still be in the American political mainstream discourse. It's a new moment. And I myself am stunned because I, I, I've been paying attention to the situation ever since those early 70s moments. And, and this is a, a kind of a first and a new horizon. And it might be a sign, I think it's true what you said, Jamie, that climate change is shoving this onto us. It's a kind of an enormous pressure that is forcing us to reconsider the way that we think about politics. Yeah, totally. I, I think it's especially salient for young people, right, who look at, uh, I don't know, some older, more conservative voters who are probably going to die of old age and say, hey, I could die of climate change if we don't do something about this. So what's up? 
Yeah. Well, they might yeah. not dive all day if we get that life uh, expansion pack. Uh, <laughs> sure, the Mars show. Then we're going to have dealing with these people forever. But uh, I am really in favor of longevity treatments um, at my age. But I can tell you from my perspective, it's not going to come fast enough. And it looks to be way harder than um, people thought back in even in the 90s. Um, there's an asymptotic uh, kind of um, resistance involved of physics and um, the difficulties of biology. Well, so, no, I think people, in fact, uh, average lifetimes are going down because our health habits are so poor. So um, I think we're stuck with what we've got. And I think that young people do need to grab hold of the uh, political discourse as fast as they can and to reject the ordinary business capitalism, which is so amazingly destructive. And now that everybody's in the precariat, that there is no middle class, that if you're not in the 1 percent, you have reason to be scared. Um, there's there's um it's, it's that impetus. You know, the reason there was a leftism in the 70s that I was part of as a young person was the Vietnam War. There's a physical, practical danger to your life that forces your politics. It's very materialist. And now the same kind of thing is happening with the precariousness of the, um, the gig economy, which is it, it really just more exploitation. Yeah, Stan, uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, <laughs> the gerontological treatment uh, perhaps not being on the horizon, um, the immediate horizon, but there is a group out in Silicon Valley, the Peter Thiels and the Elon Musks of the world, uh, who want to have that, uh, who want to be immortal uh, to the extent that they are taking young people's blood and, uh, you know, putting all sorts of money into research to extend the billionaires' lives at the rest of us. It, it touches, uh, that vision of the world, I think, touches on this kind of duality between dystopia and utopia you were talking about, because a lot of the thinking around um, technology and science and the future is pretty dark right now, especially coming out of Silicon Valley. Uh, there are the fears of this sort of AI singularity. Um, there are these ideologies of neo-reactionism and uh, the dark enlightenment or some sort of fascist accelerationism. The endarkenment, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, yeah. And these seem well, to be percolating, you know, in the same sort of way that you were talking about as a response to social and technological change. Uh, do you think that this is a, a um, science being divorced too much from the humanities? Is it an ed educational problem? Or have we just not either faced the problem correctly? Or are we letting the left, is the left letting futurism be taken over by people whose interests are not our own? There's a uh, the future is a contested space, like government is a contested space, and like science is a contested space. So they're all battlefields, ideological battlefields. A, a, a discursive struggle is everywhere now. The Silicon Valley. I have a lot of contacts down there, being one of the great space cadets of our time, and um, um, you know, an aging white male science fiction writer gets invited to a lot of these things to speak. So I take advantage of that and I've met a lot of these people and the um Elon Musk is an interesting guy. Uh, Peter Thiel is not an interesting guy. And there's, <laughs> there's a lot of fantasy going on. And all of these um, people, the billionaires, uh, of which I've met maybe a dozen now, they're all going to die in their 80s. And none of this, uh, there's a fantasy response, which is essentially a bad science fiction response. And it's not confined to one political group. Everybody would like to be immortal or live longer and they're not going to and so you can either admit that and and persist with what lifetime you're given and accept that we're mortal creatures or else you can go into fantasy lands and talk about um, uploading yourself into an AI and all of the AI people who are actually working on it down at Google and elsewhere in Silicon Valley will freely admit that that's, AI is just a fundraising uh, <laughs> phrase. There's nothing to it. It's just there isn't even machine learning to speak of and the opportunities there to help humanity are substantial in terms of crunching big data and doing the things that computers can do but it's not at all transcendent or transformative uh, and we probably Probably won't even have self-driving cars. So you've got to understand that most talk now about technological 
um, innovation. Uh, it has to do with fundraising. There's a, an awful lot of venture capital out there. After the after the quantitative easing and the 2008 crash, mm -hmm. uh, 15 trillion dollars were created and given to the banks, who then gave it to the rich. You know, 90 percent of that money went to the one percent, and then it's trickle down theory all over again. What it means is there's more investment money than there are good investment possibilities if you're trying to have a broad uh, portfolio of future tech uh, possibilities. So a lot of bullshit is getting uh, thrown around and a lot of money is getting invested in things that are going to be shown somewhere between five and 20 years later to be complete bullshit. <laughs> So um, that's just what Silicon Valley is. And you don't want to get too distracted by that as a young leftist uh, thinking about how do we change the whole uh, political slash economic system. Um, a Silicon Valley is kind of like a, a distraction like Hollywood or something. It's, it's not the real story. The real story is probably in Washington or it's out in your garden. Um, it's regenerative agriculture or it's some kind of a Green New Deal a support system. And I, and I actually think that the billionaires are – that there's two things you could do. You could say more and more often there shouldn't be any such thing as a billionaire. The tax structure should cut billionaires off. You should be able to make about $10 million a year and beyond that the tax rate rises to nearly 100% and it goes back to the people who generated it, the American society. Amen. So strong progressive taxation, uh, great. And I don't even think that needs to be called socialist, although it, it um, it's a way of tweaking us towards more leftist values, for sure. But you can remind people that during the Eisenhower era, that um, Dwight Eisenhower um, um, presided over a 91% top income tax rate, and that was when people hit $400,000, which these days would be about $4 million. So you could even say, let's just do like Eisenhower did, which I find very funny. Uh, to return to... Um uh, your your own work and and some of the interesting contrasts that it makes with uh, other more popular uh, or other uh, forms of science fiction in our popular culture. Uh, usually in science fiction, the author takes you know uh, a piece of technology or a social trend that exists in the present and projects it into the future to you know spaceships, robots, computers, etc. And you imagine that evolution into society in our society, like into the future. But in your work, you you do, of course do that with technology, but you do the same thing for economic systems and social relationships. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, like how do you approach that process of imaginative speculation uh, as it applies to, let's say, capitalism? Is it different than the same than of just imagining what computers will be like in 100 years? It's a little the same, and thanks for this question because it gets right to the heart of where I'm working and worrying. Um, and I'm going to talk to you whilst I move inside because there's somebody next door with power tools. Ah, the, first the, the wind my, chimes and then the power tools. The bane of my outdoor existence here is how <laughs> frequently power tools are employed in a neighborhood context. But um, it's throwing off the bird count. <laughs> oh, that's right. I should be out here. Damn it. Can you can you hear the power tools? Is I, that I, a don't, I can't hear them. No, I, I can't, can't hear them. But if they're power bothering you, then yeah, then yeah. don't then uh, no, by all I'm means. Here. Go. Okay. No, I mean, then let me get back to the point. Yes. Sir. Um, what I've found is that it's I, what I usually do is try to get help from scientists, and I and so in terms of technology, like how do we get to Mars? What do we do when we get to Mars? Scientists, planetologists, they're lovely helpers, and they're willing to talk. When I think of what's the next, what's post-capitalism? What's the next uh, political economy that we're going to live under? The help is remarkably. Uh, sparse. The the written political economy of the last 50 years is, I could practically name them on one hand, and they're, um, uh, they're, they're great. Uh, Herman Daly and uh, Bookchin and uh, Hazel Henderson and um, Fritjof Capra. And, and, you know, there's a, a variety, but they're kind of um, off the cutting edge uh, at this point, and at, at no point did they give me much help. So when I was writing my novels, especially the Mars books, I was scrambling. And uh, Mondragon, Spain has been a perpetual um, comfort to me as a functioning um, town that is uh, nothing but co-ops as a transitional uh -huh. state. 
I'm sorry. We can definitely hear the power tools now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Just, they must Good. have just turned them off. You up. know what? The birds are, it drives the birds away, too, so it's a it's kind of a doubling here. Okay. Um, why, don't, uh, um, why don't you... I, I'm going to keep talking while I move. Okay. As long Great. as it doesn't bother you, we're, I'm headed in. All right. Sounds good. So... Um, I, I do my research. I try to find what examples there are around the world of strong leftist communities. I think hard about um, what happened in the whole uh, Soviet experiment. I, I really tried hard to understand China. And I have to admit, China is not easy to understand. Um, yeah, Red, Red Moon, you did, you did struggle with that. Um, I, I did. Uh, uh, but it, it came out great at the end. I'm sorry. Go on. No. I'm glad to, that you brought that up because that's my most recent effort, that and the New York novel. I'm trying to imagine some uh, – what would come next? Well, maybe nobody at this point can imagine that very well. And even using the word socialist, as much as I am willing to call myself that, and I just love it that there's a democratic socialist of America doing so well. I'm, I'm happy to join that. I still think – Oh, hell yeah. I'm a, the, I'm a part of the democratic socialist of America, by so the way. I. So, oh, oh you, you both are. Thank, oh, oh, heck yeah. Oh, well, oh you did join? Right? Isn't everybody? <laughs> I mean, well, everybody should be. Will, are you in everybody. the DSA? I am a card carrying member, but uh, I, I don't go much further than that, unfortunately. Yeah, me but. too. I pay my dues and I read the things and I try to help. <laughs> we'll take uh, it. Yeah. But, but what I'm saying is maybe what the political economy that's going to come in the if we get a good one in the 21st century and maybe uh maybe it'll need a new name maybe it won't look like the older socialist attempts i what i would love to have everybody doing is de-stranding the the what you might call the toolkit what uh, the defining characteristics of socialism which ones are crucial and um, necessary, which ones are accidental and historical, and how do we apply them, the ones that are crucial and necessary, to the current moment that we're already in, because we don't get to have a fresh start. So these, I think, are the ongoing questions. <laughs> Uh, you, you, well, you brought up uh, Mondragon, Spain, and I, I. And then previously, when you were talking about Silicon Valley, like you, you sort of you talked about some of the the great potential that technology could be used to aid humanity. And I, I, I wanted to ask you about in uh, one of your novels, uh, twenty three twelve. Uh, you talk about something called the the Mondrag uh, Mondragon uh, Accords, which is sort of a. Uh, could you tell, describe that? It's like an economic system that has sort of replaced capitalism through the use of quantum computing to sort of create a centrally planned economy like that could like that gets over the hump of the problems of having a centrally planned economy through quantum computing yeah sure and that brings in all kinds of things of course but there was an old question that um if Francis Spufford's novel Red Plenty brings up the, the yes. historical moment yeah. where the Soviet Union um, uh, computer scientists were trying to invent a computer system that was strong enough to run a command economy um, without the market. And uh, that failed because of uh, corruption in the Soviet system and because it wasn't clear – uh, you know, now we've got computers so immensely powerful, the things that they can do are amazing. And if you get quantum computers, even more so. And quantum computing is another big if, but it might it might happen. And even classical computers are in, enormously strong. Why couldn't we um, put into our our economy um, what everybody needs, um, and then uh, send out to the to the factories and to the fields and then create what everybody needs and then distribute it back out to what everybody needs um, without a market. Since the prices in the market are systemically wrong um, and, and the market uh, systemically devalues people and the environment. So that's two big things that are being uh, destroyed by underpricing of the market. And when you say the market system is, is a failure, well, this is completely terrifying 
because we are in a global market system and we don't have an alternative. So in 2312, I was suggesting that in 300 years from now, we might have all these things worked out and that um, uh, trade would still exist. People would still make different things. They would still need to exchange the stuff that they make or that they do for the stuff that they don't have or that they want. So um, China has market socialism. Well, what does market socialism mean? And what are markets really? And these are questions that I'm trying to explore where um, the responses, especially when you bring up the words markets, is extremely ideological. But but on the other hand, that's not a bad thing. Um, everything is extremely ideological. It's it, just that markets are a huge force right now. They are one name for global capitalism, the market. Yeah, that's one thing that I really object to when people treat the market as this like neutral, objective, <laughs> almost yeah. naturally existing thing that is yes. not heavily mediated by ideology and created by humans ostensibly to serve humans right yeah and it's a lot a system legal system so the legal system could change and you could have something that was uh, what would you call it the post market or the pseudo market or the um the rationally contained and uh, survivable market or whatever but the when people say the market like you say that as if it's as if it's nature itself well this is a, a terrible category error and i think part of the work of the left is to is to clarify that issue that free markets are a legal regime that actually are not free for uh, most of humanity suffers in the free market system not to mention the ecology right because like this is something that i often have trouble explaining to people who maybe aren't familiar with marxist economics uh the idea that we can solve the problem of climate change under the current political and economic formation of capitalism is it, it, it's a fantasy. It's at least as much a fantasy as building socialism within our lifetimes. Right. Because under I mean, if you believe in Marxist con Marx's concept of value, um, the environment and the ecology around us, it has no value. It's just this infinite free gift that capital can use to extract value and in that sense, it's I just cannot see uh, solving this problem while continuing um, capitalist accumulation on this planet unless we expand to other planets. Right. But that's like just kind of moving the problem around. Well, but you can't expand to the other planets. That's that's definitive. So um, really, the problem has to be solved here. So, yeah, capitalist accumulation is physically impossible at a certain point, And we've reached that point. What's interesting, though, is that, I mean, I would agree with you completely. And then what's the next? How do you alter markets in a, 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 a rapid step? Uh, in other words, if you had 100 reforms in a row that you could uh, write up as legislation and enact one law after the next to get from where we are now to a um, – uh, a perpetual mobile of, of uh, ecological uh, circulation where uh, humans fitted into this biosphere on this one and only planet, what would those hundred steps be? That's the, that's the interesting question. What? And I would say this right away, the, the proclamation of the Green New Deal is a fabulous start on this. It was an impressive document. It was nowhere near as content-free as, as I was fearing. Um, and, and yet the hundred steps, the laws that you might introduce as bills in Congress, and then if you had a majority, you passed them. They became the law. People began to act according to these laws. What would those laws be? It's interesting. Um We'll mention the, the Madrigan Collective uh, that exists in the real world today. And, uh, you know, you, you um, pushing that out into the future and imagining a way that that could be a kind of overgrowth and an overcoming of capitalism. In uh, Red Moon, your most recent work, you do the same thing with the technology of uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency, which I found to be really fascinating because, A, you tied it into the uh, fundamental contradictions of capitalism we were speaking about, but also tied it to a way of accounting for uh, ecology, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, creating a, uh, you know, socialism or something beyond capitalism. Uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency is typically a uh, right libertarian thing. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how you came up with the idea of imagining a kind of financial revolution that was based on a new type of uh, currency arrangement? 
I can try, although I will immediately fall into the deep waters beyond my understanding. Um, there are radical economists that are trying to create new uh, cryptocurrency platforms that would be based on um, socially useful actions uh, as the uh, creation of value so that carbon coin, solar coin, um, these exist and, and blockchain is at the basis of all the cryptocurrency as a technology, but blockchain is also a way of distributing information that can't be altered after the fact amongst a large population. That's, that's its very definition. So these things could be uh, great populist socialist tools and um, money itself, you create more money, like say in this quantitative easing after the 2008 crash, uh, more money means more expenditure, means more exploitation of nature, means more running out of finite resources, means more climate change, more more CO2 burned into the atmosphere. So uh, money itself as a measure of value and as a uh, generator of, of human energies, if there was a um, a currency that was based on doing good things and the currency didn't exist without them. There is now a plan, and if you Google it, I hope the right papers will come out. It's called carbon quantitative easing, where the central banks of the world create new money as they did after 2008, and they don't, instead of giving it to the banks, they they create it and give it out based on how much carbon you have sequestered uh, in a reliable uh, certified blockchain manner and so this their carbon coin is like you save 100 tons of carbon or you bury 100 tons of carbon or somehow fix it to rocks and then you've got one carbon coin which would then trade on the currency exchanges with other forms of currency like the franc the dollar etc and if the carbon coin was supported by the essential banks of the world with a like a 100 year bond so that in Investors in the normal capitalist financialized world would say, well, uh, we could we could um, fool around with the dollar um, um, remnim B exchange or we could invest in carbon coins and know that we'll get a payoff on a regular basis that. In other words, doing the right thing could compete financially with doing the wrong thing. Right. So if you if you Google carbon quantitative exchange, hopefully you'll get a paper called by a by a economist named Chen. Uh, I think it's D Chen C H E N, and it's an interesting paper. It's getting some traction. It's getting some discussion. Um, there's another new group called Economists for an Inclusive Prosperity. Um, E FIP, and uh, they're brand new. Like uh, their announcement came out day before yesterday. Um, mainstream economists with a leftist uh, bent or a desire for survivability, or, or a desire to make economics work again for the good of humanity, and that's a pretty big and vibrant group of mainstream economists. So, in other words, the front is broad, but but the problems are pretty clear that have to be solved. And I, I myself am just a storyteller. I I'm trying to learn about this stuff, but what I really would love is for um, a lot of academic economists and whole economics departments to become political economy departments instead of economics departments mm. and to propose new changes. That That's such a good idea. <laughs> I mean, like, we've talked a lot on the show about how economics, uh, I think it was Richard Wolff who said that the function of economics departments right now in universities is primarily ideological. Yeah. Right? And or it's like an old joke about how at every university, the economics department and business school are like on completely different campuses because they, you know, one they teach you the bullshit and yeah. the other one they teach you how, how to actually how to be really the ruling class. Yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. 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 So yeah. like this stuff is certainly ideological, these changes that we're talking about, but like it's not unideological the way we do things now. And that's something I'm always trying to call people's attention to. Well, I hope it's generally understood. I think things are getting contentious enough and dangerous enough that that is more and more understood. Uh, now that there is no such thing as, as news, now that there's no such thing as objectivity, I think it's really becoming understood. And that's a good understanding because it was always true that everything was ideological. And now that everybody realizes that what you want is an ideology that explains the most and gives you the most positive ways 
ways forward. Um, I didn't understand for a long time that economics doesn't mean anything but the quantitative analysis of capitalism, that economics is not in the business of doing political economy, that they're two different fields of human thought. And um, I was like most people, I think, in that I was thinking that economics and political economy were the same thing, but it's not true. Economics' job is just to analyze capitalism and then the currently existing set of laws and see what their effects are and maybe suggest some tweaks, but never basic and fundamental reforms. And then political economy is a 19th century thing that went away when capitalism basically took over the world. So you have political economy back in, you know, you could be like Fourier, you could be like uh, Proudhon, you could be like Marx and Engels, you know, there was political economy. And now there's just economics. But I think political economy ha is coming back out of necessity. I hope you're right. Yeah, me too. Uh, so to switch gears a little bit, uh, uh -huh. it, you know, the sun's gone down. This is Antifada after dark now. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of cool drugs in the Mars books, <laughs> all of oh, which yeah. seem to be legal in this utopian future society um there are also other pleasures like the bathhouses where young people go to get each other off and basically invent new ways to come uh are you trying to turn young people socialist by promising them sins of the flesh <laughs> well that's a good idea um, <laughs> maybe that was it all along I, I that know. is the mindset <laughs> One of the things about being a leftist, and I must say that a lot of this comes out of the, the 70s. The 70s were extremely radical uh, in ways that are probably hard to um, – um, I can barely remember them and especially the feel of them. And for young it people – It shows like you did this, it right. Yeah, well done. <laughs> for young people like yourselves, it's um, it's a uh, the '70s is like what for me would have been the, like the 1930s. You just can't recover times 40 years ago and and capture how they really felt while you were living in them. So a lot of my writing comes out of a couple of core beliefs that that pleasure is good, that puritanism is bad, that um, uh, fiction and especially American popular fiction was all about uh, sex and violence and I didn't want to write about violence so I uh, decided to compensate for that lack by writing more about sex and the bonobo be, way yeah I try to be honest about it and 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 have some fun with it and it's actually very hard to write about uh, intelligently and and with a sense of fun and 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 that's there's so many human um, activities that are hard to write down that there's no reason to pick on that one but um, I think it's important to insist that uh, a good life includes a, a sense of um, young people having a, a, a sense of the pursuit of happiness, of, uh, of the potential, and that your, your 20s in particular ought to be a gigantic adventure and not a period of anxiety and dread. <laughs> I mean, it's fairly simplistic on my part. I, I'm not a... a, a complicated thinker no i totally um, agree and it's it, it's especially salient looking at what's happening to young people right now right like kids are having fewer adventures basically they're having less sex yeah. they're not experimenting with drugs they don't even want to get their driver's licenses which i find yeah. like kind of alarming and i think Part of it has got to be that, you know, their futures are looking more and more uncertain that, you know, their parents really want to protect them and just like train them to be as productive as possible at all times. Sure. And they th and they themselves have to worry, um, will I have health insurance and a pension? Will I uh, have a place to live? Will, can I make enough money to have a, a decent life, have adequacy? These are, when these are worries, then you're going to see political change, I think. But to um, – I, I, I feel like um, – how can I say it? The – when the situation is as bad as it is now, then there should be a push, and I'm seeing the push. This is why you get the uh, young people declaring that they're socialists. There's a, a rebellion against the, the trap that they see themselves in. 
And there are other things. Uh, oh, I know. The other thing I wanted to mention is the is the internet and screens. That um, you you all are the first generation to have grown up with screens, and it's easy, especially with the minds of young men, to get trapped into the screens as an alternative reality, and it's easier uh, than a real reality. And you get a whole bunch of dopamine rewards, speaking of drugs, for small accomplishments in the games that you play and the interactions that you have. And in short, it's a virtual reality already that is replacing real reality in a bad way. And so some of these, like I don't need a driver's license, I don't need to go outdoors, I still have a full life because I have World of Warcraft or whatever, something newer than that, I'm sure. Fortnite, um, this I is believe. A- yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to resist yeah. the urge to call Sean out right now. Now for all the nights he's ignored me while playing Fortnite. <laughs> yeah, well, see, this is a category error. And what I want to suggest is there you are in Brooklyn. You're thinking, well, I'm in a city. What can I do about it? You can just walk down to the East River and sit there underneath in Dumbo, underneath the Brooklyn Bridge, and just watch the river flow by. And you will have had a better gaming experience <laughs> than anything you can do online. Oh, well, we so are living is, in a simulation. From your mouth to God's ears, though. <laughs> yeah, but um, I realize that. But on the other hand, as a, as a you know, an aging public intellectual and and also an aging hippie, if I can call out to the younger generation that anything you do outdoors, including like throwing pebbles at a bottle on a, on a post, is like a way better video game than any video game ever invented. It has more pixels, it has more texture, <laughs> it has better problems, it has better dopamine results. That sitting down a, across from someone and, and brewing up some uh, coffee and drinking tea and having a face-to-face conversation is just way better than anything that can be done on a screen. Well, I realize that this is a little bit um, swimming upstream in the current culture. And I, I mean, I have uh, I have two sons who are young men who are just laugh at me when I say things like this. But I'm convinced that it's true. And also, I point to a historical example. In London, when telephones were first introduced into common around the turn of the century, say 1904, everybody spent two or three hours in the day talking on the telephone to somebody across town because it was so remarkable that they could do so rather than crossing town or talking to somebody in the same room with them. I feel we're in that moment with the internet and a time's going to come when a lot of people are going to unhook, unplug, uh, kill their Facebook account and walk outdoors and, and go to the local park or go to the local coffee shop and sit there looking at somebody's actual living face and realizing they're having more fun, I more think, dope. I think Will, as somebody who would never be uh, described as extremely online, uh, had a question. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, this is uh, uh, going more back to the uh, the, the fun uh, sex and drug stuff, but or perhaps maybe yeah. in a, uh, uh, something that you don't necessarily have to swim as hard upstream in our culture, particularly among young people. Um, another theme in your books, uh, in addition to imagining a, a post-capitalist economy or, or society, uh, you definitely also imagine a post-gender society. And I'm speaking specifically in 2312, uh, the two main characters of the book, and the book kind of is a love story between them, are both sort yeah. of uh, a-gender, I don't know quite, like the main character, Swan, they're capable of, I think, if I'm remembering this right, both uh, male and female sexual reproduction, but you're also talk about sort of post-nuclear family and different sort of ways of raising children that are outside of this this current paradigm, which, again, I think more and more young people, like we, we learn more and more about this every day. And I was just, you know, again, like, how is that process of uh, that imaginative process work? Or like, you know, what are you drawing from? And how, where do you see? It? Yeah, what's with all this cultural Marxism? <laughs> what's with all this? Yeah, <laughs> let's, well, let's, let's fight uh, gender. It's, um, it's really... Don't uh, you know the working class is socially reactionary? Come on. <laughs> Well, I would. I don't know about that anymore. I'm not sure there's any working class anymore that isn't in China, and uh, they've got their own problems. But for us, I'm basically reflecting San Francisco. Um, that's the capital of California, and that is a very much of a gender uh, fluid place, and I love it. I love. I I adore San Francisco. It's really the capital of my heart. I go down there. I essentially I'm a guy that lives in the provinces of San Francisco, and I drive down there. It takes about an hour and a half. I I get there and I'm having a blast and then I come back to my boring little university town and and it's except exceptionally boring and San Francisco is exceptionally exciting and I have friends there who've taught me all kinds of things uh, trans friends gay friends whatever also just straight friends who are a part of that community and uh, young, one young uh, person and I don't I can't even remember their gender 
gender identity, which could be anything, said to me once, well, it's all skin. Stan, it's all skin. And I, that was like a, a little uh, 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 switch turning on in my mind. This is when I was doing 2312. I thought, well, yeah, that's true. I mean, what's the big deal? And of course, there are the social roles. The, the, uh, of course, there's patriarchy and, and there's, um, there's uh, all kinds of cultural determinants. But when you get down to uh, bodies and individuals, well, it's all skin. So, you know, as an aging straight male, this was like a mind boggler. But I did have one experience that was transformative. I brought up my two boys as the Mr. Mom figure, as the daily work of taking care of infants and toddlers. Because my wife is a chemist. She worked, you know, 12 hours a day. And from the very moment our first kid was 10 weeks old, I was the the cultural role of mom, of, of a 1950s housewife, except, of course, I was writing these novels during nap time. Mm. Well, I spent a lot of time with women. It was women doing that work. And in fact, women still do all the work, uh, the work of social reproduction, um, taking care of infants and toddlers, uh, teaching young people in schools, uh, nursing the sick, and taking care of the dying. These are all 90% uh, women's work occupations, and they're poorly paid. Women they're paid at all sometimes they're unpaid and social reproduction is the is the real work that capitalism is a parasite on so uh, paying attention to all that stuff when i was hanging out and sometimes there would be groups of 20 moms or au pair young women and their kids their their infant toddlers and me the and that is not a, a wonderful harem like oh my god i've got all these women around me that's actually un- uncomfortable and i knew i was screwing up the discourse in that room by being there type of uh, experience it was you wrote an- um, specifically about that in your in the capital series right when you're uh, talking yes. about um, being in the gym gymboree or whatever it was yes yes <laughs> that was very autobiographical <laughs> okay um, but yeah, in, uh, in 2312, you describe like uh, uh, a kind of crash model for uh, child rearing and, and, and yes. sort, of, kind of, sort of a communal family uh, group. Where yes. did, that, where did the, the like sort of genesis for that idea come from? Oh, there's a it lot of it in the Mars books, too. Yeah, yeah. Like, yes, um, that's right. The, the idea of Zygote, the, the, one of the secret yeah. uh, bases. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and like it reminds me of a lot of stuff I've read by uh, Alexandra Kolontai. Clara Zetkin and other uh, Soviet era thinkers because they were really wrestling with this idea because they knew, right, that one thing keeping us from having gender equality was the work of social reproduction, which was so much more often being done by women. But then then there were people who kind of bent the stick too far in the other direction who are like, well, you know, parents are just incubators. They shouldn't have any contact with their kids at all. They're like too emotional to like handle such an important task. And that seems kind of unhuman to me too and i feel like you kind of come down in the middle where like you know what maybe it should be a personal choice how much or how little involvement you have in the work of social reproduction or raising your kids or like um maybe there should be a balance between um you know the familial biological bonds or whatever and the community yeah I would like that balance. I would go with what Jamie just said about a balance between, because you can go too far both ways. The the 1950s nuclear household, suburban castle, two parents, two kids, is um, bad. It's bad for you. Um, it's normed in America, but it was. it's not historically normal. Usually you'd have a big old house with three or four generations kind of banging around in there. So there's the big house model, there's the village model, and there's the paleolithic um, pack model, I called it, the, the mini tribe of uh, four or five families and multiple generations. And then, of course, you still have your parents the, biologically, and I am pretty confident that that will persist, uh, despite all the gender fluidity in terms of making babies, um, the bulk of them, it, it, when you don't have technological help involved, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to be uh, one man, one woman, uh, a zygote, and on it comes to be a baby, so there's parents. Parents. And who knows what the gender identity of this man, woman, I've, I've used them with quotes around them, but on the other hand, there's biology going on here. Then you got kids, but they could be brought up by 
a group with the acknowledgement of their parents and their parents basically getting help. That balance, I think, is is the best way. Again, I was lucky when my wife and I moved out back to Davis where we had met and we had been in Washington, D.C., which was um, as greener shows, poor Charlie's experiences, nuclear isolation, yes. going crazy with a kid, um, doing your best. And actually, it's a lovely bonding experience to be spending every day with an infant toddler. It's one of the most beautiful human experiences of all. I would, you don't want to miss out on that. Uh, on the other hand, when we moved back to Davis, we moved into Village Homes, which is a kind of a hippie version of suburbia. It tried to imitate the English village model. Uh, my my little front yard is a courtyard, but mainly there's no fences here. It's all agricultural, uh, the landscaping. I've got my garden plot. And I've got a, a preschool center that I took my kids to where I they met all their friends and then their parents became my friends. And so uh, the what what that taught me was that design and urban design and and, and uh, what you might call civic design it can shape social relations intensively uh, because I have lived a kind of English village life of the year 1600 <laughs> uh, simply because of the way they designed this particular utopian I mean and the best friends in my life are the are the parents of my kids friends and my my kids and their friends aren't even friends anymore but I'm totally friends with their parents still because we still live here so i've li i've seen one version of the balance and the crash model i think is a good name for it uh, you can't go too far the other way because then you get to the boarding school model, which is – it's actually a syndrome in, in British psychological pathology. You know, if you got sent away to a boarding school when you were six years old or nine years old, like so many middle-class Brits did, you end up crazy. Um, or or like the, the British ruling class where all – you know, they're all their boarding schools just like – A lot of buggering. You're, you're ritually abused. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you learn to so – you learn that it teaches you to do it to other people. Like that's how yeah. you view other people is just, you know, sadistically basically – Yes, yes. And I have uh, several friends, uh, British friends who went through this system and they just shake their heads and say, that's definitely not the right way. Right. <laughs> so what are you going to do except try to um, uh, try to find the balance between us as social primates that have a really deep uh, – I, I believe that culture – I believe in sociobiology. I'm just saying that as sociobiology actually leads you to leftism. Um, this is something I would suggest to all young leftists that uh, – like you were saying that um, cryptocurrency looks like a right-wing libertarian thing, and it sort of does when it's Bitcoin. And uh, social biology was immediately tagged as being a right-wing, uh, right makes, might makes right type. E.O. Uh, Wilson, uh, yeah. E. Oh, Wilson. yeah. Well, I've heard a lot of people be very uh, highly suspicious of anything to do with sociobiology just because it's been used for, you know, really reactionary purposes in the past. Yes, but I would say this, that they're mistaking it for social Darwinism, and it's not. That E.O. Wilson is great. I love him. And his uh, student, Sarah Hurdy, wrote a book called Mother Nature that um, puts the feminist slant on social biology in a way that E.O. Wilson would thoroughly approve. The the primates, since we are a primate, the primates that we're most closely related to, some of them are gangsters like chimps. Some of them are hippies like bonobos. Um, there's no uh, determinism. There's no biological determinism all social biology is trying to do is say well let's see what we can learn from the fact that we are animals no matter what our brains and our internet screens tell us yeah totally we're, we're primates we we're contain multitudes off the savannah yeah sidebar and, sorry well i just want to i just want to continue to say that if you follow that lesson very far it leads you to a good life you begin to think i got to spend more time outdoors i should really walk a little bit every day i should maybe try dancing having a lot of sex throwing rocks at things um, you know altering my consciousness consciousness on a, a regular but controlled basis. I, all these things are paleolithic and good for you. Yeah, that is the uh, yeah. mindset. Swan, uh, the main character in 2312, one of my favorite uh, little conceits in that book, is that uh, there is even some question about whether she remains, uh, or I should say they remain, uh, human because as part of some ritual or just party, she ingests uh, an alien, hallucinogenic alien <laughs> yeah. bacteria that continues yeah. to sort of <laughs> multiply inside yeah. them as kind of the f internal flora of their body. Yeah. I'd like to I do that. I was ahead of the curve. 
I was ahead of the curve on this gut microbiome and yeah. how much the microbiome. Because in 2011, when I was writing this stuff, uh, that wasn't quite as uh, known as it is now. It's funny how quickly things have changed. And we may indeed find alien bacteria on Enceladus or on Europa. Now, eating it would be a bold move. <laughs> That's all I can say. But uh, Swan is a bold person. Right. Well, I got to read that one. Um, the scene in the end of Blue Mars, uh, you know, spoiler alert, when they all take uh, Sax's memory pill treatment uh, really reminds me of descriptions I've heard of what it's like to trip on Ibogaine. Uh, are you familiar uh, with Ibogaine or Ibogaine or Iboga? I've only, I've only heard of it. I've never tried it. And I'm, I'm like too old to try new drugs, as I have to <laughs> confess to you. But um, when I was young, uh, the what I, I'm really loving this rehabilitation of psychedelics because for about 40 years, I've just felt embarrassed at the stupidities of my youth. And now it's turning out that it wasn't so stupid after all, except that we didn't actually know what we were taking. But if we were taking what we thought we were taking, psychedelics are now being seen to be a very powerful and profound uh, changer of consciousness, not just while you're tripping. And in fact, that's almost the, not the most important part, but afterwards, somehow. Absolutely. There, uh, the Michael Pollan book has been a revelation and um, it's brought all that stuff back onto the table. And then, again, for people in their 20s or in their 30s who are still uh, young and semi-immortal and can, and can stand the psychic shock of the, an event that big, um, I think it's good for you. I've, yeah, learned, I've, learned, I've learned some important things, I got to say, about myself and the world from taking psychedelics. So I co-sign that. Same, uh, same. Ibogaine was famously yeah. the drug that uh, Hunter S. Thompson uh, completely made up that Democratic presidential candidate Ed Muskie was on and attributed <laughs> to his bizarre behavior. But he made that out of whole cloth, but actually got oh, that involved in this 1972 presidential <laughs> election. Oh, my God. Well, Thompson. Wow. <laughs> the road of excess leads to wisdom he was a very excessive guy i was never that excessive i have to say it was all for me rather um, um uh, mountain oriented uh, a sort of a sierra uh sierra and surfing oriented i was very much of a nature hippie and um yeah, I'd very much recommend uh, the, if you're going to do them, uh, combining uh, psychedelics with the outdoors in some sort of uh, calm, controlled uh, way. There's Are not, you saying no you shouldn't way. take psychedelics and go see Hillary Clinton speak I, at a well, technocratic <laughs> hell festival? Uh, Jamie, you and I can do that. But I'm just saying <laughs> like, for, for, for the kids at yeah, home. Yeah, don't try this at home. <laughs> this is this is a thing that we did to ourselves because we're tenth oh, level but, but, trippers. But you did, came out the other did side. You laugh? Did you end up a jelly of laughter on the floor? Because that would be the best uh, trip. I was it's, laughing, but mainly I, it just underscored. Laughing and crying. I mean, it, just, it mainly underscored for me how fucking boring everything was. <laughs> <laughs> how much you didn't want to be watching Hillary Clinton. <laughs> yeah, didn't Matt compare it to one of those like hollow Tibetan bells, like perfect nothingness when we when we were hearing Tom Perez speak? Oh my God. So, so stand yeah. on that. Speaking of spirituality. Yeah, to, con to, con to continue on this, um, especially in the Mars books, in the Mars trilogy, um, you riff on something that I think is kind of bedeviled um, the left or socialist or communist um, through the ages or at least through the centuries which is what is the role of um, spirituality you know um, if we are these these primates uh, the spiritual experience seems to be something that's somewhat universal uh, for folks but yet there's been a lot of leftists who've taken a very hard line against uh, religion in the Mars book uh, Hiroko comes up with an entire uh, religious system essentially based around uh, Mars and this and the spread of life so how do you envision uh, for yourself you know spiritual spirituality fitting into some sort of post capitalist society good question if I revert to a kind of a, a existentialist stance that um, the universe exists humanity came to being by accident um, there is no meaning to anything. So that if you take that as the base situation, then you have to make up your own meaning. It's a it's a human creative act to make up meaning. And so 
religio from the Latin is to bind together. So you can, the meaning comes from solidarity with other people and trying to reduce suffering. And so I get led towards uh, Buddhism as a good um, binding together. But then there's also just this kind of cosmic consciousness of why are, what is consciousness how what is this universe a big a gigantic why kind of shouted in your face um w- with no no obvious answer but but um it is kind of amazing miraculous and and mystical that we're here at all uh having our thoughts so it's a combination of those things that i think will never go away I, the brain scientists are finding you know the religious center of the brain is in the temporal lobe near the near the site of hypergraphia and epilepsy and babbling it's kind of funny um the the part of your brain that trips on that when you get these moments of cosmic consciousness or of solidarity with the, all people are one kind of thing or all living creatures are one which is a better this kind of biophilia or biosphere or consciousness of the biosphere being a single earthly body it's 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 quite beautiful and um if it strikes you as as uh, real enough to uh, believe in or affirm, then that becomes the meaning. So that never goes away. And I, and all the political work then is to clear the decks so that you don't have the unnatural suffering and the 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 various human badnesses of uh, greed and violence that those get cleared away by an organization of society so that you can just feel better the the deeper meanings the the cosmic meanings so i think that's how it works and i keep trying to write that out i i the the uh, lessons to me from gary snyder are, are crucial and and my life in the sierras my life as a kind of a, a, a california hippie buddhist are they they mean a lot to me well, I have to say that um, for the listeners out there who have never read a Kim Stanley Robinson book, now is the time to go to your nearest bookseller in person, not go on Amazon.com and order from a screen, but actually walk down to a bookstore and interact with human beings and uh, pick up one of uh, Stan's excellent works. Yeah. Um, it's it's really helpful, I think, in like at least for me, I think for a lot of people who maybe are new to these kinds of ideas and maybe don't want to like spend hours reading some dense theoretical text. Like I love science fiction because it's, it's fun to read uh, the good, the good stuff. It's very human and it helps you think through these things and wrap your mind around them in a really, a really cool and unique way that I don't think you can get from anything else. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, uh, science fiction is great because it's sort of like ideology. It's it's a story we tell ourselves about the future, and the the stories we tell about the future tells us, you know, uh, what you know what we really believe and what we what we want for ourselves. And uh, you know, Stan, your your works have been uh, hugely influential on me, and uh, along with the uh, you know many other great. Uh, science fiction authors or just fiction in general I think it teaches us so much about politics and ourselves really and I, I can imagine living without it well thank you for that I am a patriot of science fiction as a as a way of uh, thinking and it's uh, kind of my hometown uh, it's a it's a small community it's scattered all over the earth but if you, when we gather all in one place there's only just a few to several thousand of us and uh, I love that hometown uh, although I think that everybody in that hometown would hope to also exist in the big city of the of the larger world, but yeah, science fiction is a beautiful a way of a lens to put onto current life. It's most, especially for savvy p- political people, um, it's an easily transcodable. So you read a science fiction text and you can tag the year it was written. You can tag the political mm. angle of the writer. There, uh, it's a kind of game that you can play that is not a very hard game <laughs> uh, because it's inevitable that the writer is going to reveal aspects of their personality, big aspects of their politics, and also the time that they're writing it in. You can't escape that just by pretending to be futuristic. Um, you can make efforts to be mind-boggling by, by uh, uh, like I did in 2312, and that's a kind of a, uh, a craft trick, but you can never really escape the moment that you're writing in. So um, I, it's a 
it's I would agree with uh, Jamie. The heavy texts, I read them. I try to strip mine them and read them as fast as I can. It's not that much fun. But when I read a novel, boy, I am immersed in some other reality. And I'm enjoying it even as I'm analyzing it. It's just like telepathy or time travel combined into one package. It's it's a, it's my favorite thing. In a way, literature is my uh, religion. And then the reason I'm so involved in politics is that I think that that political engagement makes better literature. So my ultimate allegiance is to is to literature itself as a meaning system. So I'm glad that you guys are reading it. I'm glad. I very much appreciate it. Sean, Jamie, Will, it's been it's been a big pleasure. I I hope you'll censor this so that I haven't completely blown oh, no. my cover. But I actually feel like my complete works have blown my cover so completely. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing I can say that will be shocking at this point. All the cards are on the table. Well, thank you yeah. so much. It was, it's I, been a I real hope, pleasure I, uh, speaking with one of our uh, our literary heroes. So uh, your 